Hello students, today we will continue with class 11 business study chapter 3 that is private, public and global enterprises. We have already discussed the difference between a public enterprise and a private enterprise. The various public enterprises such as departmental undertaking and statutory corporation. Today we will continue with the third type of public enterprise that is government company. What is a government company? According to Indian Companies Act 1956, government company means at least 51 percent of paid up capital held by central or state government or jointly by both. Shares are purchased in the name of President of India. Where are government companies most suitable? When an enterprise has to be run on business lines when we have to compete with the private sector. Next, when financial and technical subscription from private and foreign enterprises is required. For example, BHEL, Indian Oil Corporation. The features of government companies are, first of all, it must be registered under Companies Act 1956. It must have a separate legal entity, that is, it can file suit against a third party and can be sued. A government company does enjoy financial autonomy. So, it can enter into contract and acquire property in its own name. The auditor is appointed by the central government and report is presented in the parliament. What are the advantages or merits of a government company? First of all, government company is easy to form. That is, it can be established by fulfilling the requirements of Indian Companies Act. So, no separate act is required in parliament. A government company has separate legal entity apart from the government. A government company does enjoy autonomy in all management decisions and takes actions according to business prudence. By providing goods and services at reasonable prices, they are able to control the market and curb unhealthy business practices. Despite all these advantages, a government company does suffer from certain limitations like lack of responsibility as it is not directly answerable to the parliament. Secondly, incomplete operational autonomy as the management rests in the hands of the government. There is a board with government representatives who interfere in the day to day running of a government company. Now we come to the next topic which is changing role of public sector. At the time of independence, it was expected that public sector enterprises would play an important role in achieving certain objectives of the economy. The public sector would build up infrastructure for other sectors of the economy and invest in key areas. The private sector which was unwilling to invest in projects which required heavy investment and long gestation periods. What is a gestation period? Gestation period is the time lag between the amount invested and the result acquired. The government then took it upon itself to develop infrastructure facilities and provide for goods and services essential for the economy. The Indian economy is in a stage of transition. The five year plans in the initial stages of development give a lot of importance to public sector. In the post 90s period, the new economic policies emphasized liberalization, privatization and globalization. If a public sector was making losses continuously, it was referred to the board of industrial and financial reconstruction that is BIFR for complete overhauling and shutdown. Various committees were set up to study the working of inefficient public sector units with reports on how to improve their managerial efficiency and profitability. First of all, development of infrastructure. In the pre-independence period, basic infrastructure was not developed and therefore, industrialization progressed at a very slow pace. The process of industrialization cannot be sustained without adequate transportation and communication facilities, fuel and energy and basic 
and heavy industries. The private sector did not show any initiative to invest in heavy industries or develop it in any manner. They did not have trained personnel or finances to immediately establish heavy industries, which was the requirement of the economy. It was only the government which could mobilize huge capital, coordinate industrial construction and train technicians and workforce, rail, road, sea and air transport was the responsibility of the government and their expansion has to be contributed to the pace of industrialization and ensured economic growth. Investments were to be made to first of all give infrastructure to core sector which requires huge capital investment complex and upgraded technology, big and effective organization structure like steel plants, power generation plants, civil aviation, railways, petroleum, state trading, coal, etc. Secondly, to give a lead in investment to the core sector where private sector enterprises are not functioning in the desired direction like fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, petrochemicals, newsprint, medium and heavy engineering. Third, give direction to future heavy investments like hotels, project management, consultancies, textiles, automobiles, etc. Next motive of government was regional balance. The government is responsible for developing all regions and state in a balanced way and removing regional disparities. Most of the industrial progress was limited to a few areas like the port towns in the pre-independence period. After 1951, the government laid down in its five-year plans that particular attention should be paid to those regions which were lagging behind and public sector was deliberately set up in the backward areas to accelerate economic development, provide employment to the workforce and develop ancillary industries. Development of backward regions as to ensure a regional balance in the country is one of the major objectives of planned development. Economies of scale, where large industries are required to be set up with capital outlay, the public sector had to step in to take advantage of economies of scale. Electric power plants, natural gas, petroleum and telephone industries are some of the examples of public sector setting up large scale units. These required a larger base to function economically which was only possible with government resources and mass scale production. Next motive was to check over concentration of economic power. The public sector acts as a check over the private sector. In the private sector, there are very few industrial houses which would be willing to invest in heavy industries with the result that wealth gets concentrated in a few hands and monopolistic practices are encouraged. This gives rise to inequalities in income which is detrimental to the society. The public sector is able to set large industries which requires heavy investment and thus the income and benefits that accrue are shared by a large number of employees and workers. This prevents concentration of wealth and economic power in the private sector. Import substitution. During the second and third five year plan periods, India was aiming to be self-reliant in many spheres. Obtaining foreign exchange was a problem and it was difficult to import heavy machinery required for a strong industrial base. At that time, public sector companies involved in heavy engineering which would help in heavy substitution were established. Simultaneously, several public sector companies like STC and MMTC have played an important role in expanding exports of the country. Government policy towards the public sector since 1991. Government of India had introduced four major reforms in the public sector in its new industrial policy in 1991. 
they are restructure and revive potentially viable PSUs that is those public sector undertakings which are capable of being revived and coming into good performance. Secondly, close down PSUs which cannot be revived that is which are incurring continuous losses. Thirdly, bring down government equity in all non-strategic PSUs to 26 percent or lower. The motive was to fully protect the interest of workers. Reduction in the number of industries reserved for the public sector from 17 to 8 and then to 3. In 1956 resolution of industrial policy, 17 industries were reserved for the public sector. But in 2001 ultimately, it was restricted to only 3 industries that is atomic energy, arms and rail transport. This means that the private sector could enter all areas except the three and the public sector would have to compete with them. Therefore, both the public sector and private sector need to be viewed as mutually complementary part of the national sector. Next step was to disinvest shares of a select set of public sector enterprises. Disinvestment means the sale of equity shares to the private sector and the public. The objective was to raise resources and encourage wider participation of general public and workers in the ownership of these enterprises. The primary objective of privatizing public sector enterprises are releasing large amount of public resources locked up in non-strategic public sector enterprises so that they may be utilized on other social priority areas such as basic health, family welfare and primary education. Secondly, reducing the huge amount of public debt and interest burden, transferring the commercial risk to the private sector so that funds are invested in able projects, freeing these enterprises of government control and introduction of corporate governance and in many areas where the public had monopoly. For example, telecom sector, the consumers have benefited by more choices, lower prices and better quality of products and services. Next, policy regarding sick units to be the same as that of the private sector. All public sector units are referred to the board of industrial and financial reconstruction to decide whether sick units have to be restructured or closed down. Next. Memorandum of Understanding that is improving performance through a Memorandum of Understanding or MOU system by which managements are granted greater autonomy but held accountable for specific results. Students, let us test our comprehension of the topics discussed till now through these review questions. First of all, public enterprises are owned by there are four options A government, B joint stock company, C private entrepreneurs or D multinational corporations. Which one is correct? Obviously, A part that is government. Second, which of the following is not a public sector enterprise? A departmental undertaking, government company, statutory corporation or sole proprietorship it is easy to guess. It is D, sole proprietorship. Third, a government company is a company in which paid up capital held by the government is not less than A, 50 percent, B, 51 percent, C, 75 percent or D, 26 percent. The answer is B, that is 51 percent, which means more than half of the capital is with the government. Fourth, Government interference in day to day working is the highest in case of departmental undertaking, government company, statutory corporation or none of the above. It is highest in the part A that is departmental undertaking. Let us recapitulate whatever we have discussed in this chapter till now. We came to know what are the features of public sector 
the difference between public sector and private enterprises. The various forms of public enterprises which are departmental undertaking, statutory corporation and government companies. The features, merits and limitations of each of them. Changing role of public sector. In the next session, we will continue with another important topic that is global enterprises. Thank you. Thank you.